It looks like it's working. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Today, I'm going to speak about um, a problem that a lot of people have, a lot of people that do front-end development and back-end development, and how those teams work together. So before that, um, let me tell you a story. Um, about two months ago, let's see if it works. Yep. About two months ago, I did one of the craziest things in my life. I took my wife and two cats and went to uh, New York City. So we moved from Israel to New York City like two months ago, and I'm trying to figure out how, how things are working here and no, trying to meet new people. Um, and actually, the whole point of this talk is some of you inviting me for a drink uh, at a nice restaurant or a nice uh, cafe uh, so I can learn new places. Um, so quickly about me, uh, for the last few years, I've been developing consulting and teaching everything related to front end, uh, being Angular and React. And also I organize a bunch of meetups and international conferences uh, in Israel and in New York City. I worked a book on Redux and I worked as head of New York office at 500 Tech. Um, I'll skip that slide because Boris will definitely speak about it. Um, also, one thing that I noticed here in, in, in the States that everyone has to have a Twitter account with a lot of followers. And for me, I'm just trying to understand how people use it because I see people tweeting two times a day, 10, 10 times a day, and I just can't understand how it works. So I have two ideas. The first idea, please raise your hand uh, if, you have, if you know any good restaurant or cafe in Manhattan area. OK, you know what to do, right? <laughs> and the other idea is every time I speak at meetups here, I have a tradition to take an, a selfie with the audience. And this time, I'm going to this corner. And I'll please everyone say, like, hi, and be like super crazy. Woo! Cool. Nice. So this is now live on Twitter. I guess that's how we do it. I don't know. So remember about cafes and restaurants, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, actually, before that, let me ask you a question. Who here worked with uh, front-end teams before? Who actually does front-end here? Wow. So that's an, an old meetup. You see like half of the people, half of people doing front-end here. So the next question would be, um, did you or um, maybe one of your colleagues failing or was at risk of delaying um, a UI feature because the API behind it wasn't ready yet? Did you, like, was it risk of delaying a UI feature because the backend wasn't ready? Cool. So I have a solution for you today. But uh, first of all, let me talk about the pattern. Um, for years, I've been working with small and large companies with a lot of teams using different um, stacks, uh, full stack developers, front end developers working with back end teams. And I've noticed a pattern. And the pattern is that usually front end development goes much, much faster than back end developer, uh, back end development. And it's not to say that backend developers are lazy or incompetent or something. I love them. You're like really doing complicated stuff. But this is how it works usually in a lot of companies. And you know, the fact that you raise your hand shows it like that it's true. And we've been looking for solutions. So there are a few solutions to solve that problem. Um, like you can write your own um, proxy server you know, to mimic, uh, to, um, to mock requests from server. Right um, until the API gets ready. You can use libraries like JSON Server. Who used JSON Server here at least once? Yeah. So there are, a lot, there are a lot of tools that kind of try to solve this problem. But there are a lot of problems with them as well. So first of all, all of these tools have a learning curve. So before you start using things like Schmock or um, JSON Server, you have to go through the whole readme and try, just try to understand how to make this thing work before you even start using it. And also, you have to add your special configuration for your applications. For example, if you have one feature that is not implemented on the server yet, you have to reroute the um, whole APIs to a different proxy server, right? And then uh, change it for production later on. Also, you know, when, if, if you work with teams, you need to somehow synchronize all of these mocks, right? So you wrote some mock, how do you share it with the other team or with our team members or other teams uh, or even other departments? And a lot of other problems that we faced with all of these tools, and we tried a lot of them. I'll take a look. Yeah, it's all uh, whiny stuff. 
And we were kind of disappointed because there wasn't no single tool that we really liked. Uh, so is there a solution? So before I speak about a solution, let me tell you another story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a lot of stories today because it's more interesting than, than just doing technical stuff, right? Uh, who, likes, who likes technical talks? So about, few years ago, about two years ago, uh, when we were running our Angular meetup uh, in Israel, um, two people wrote to us and said, um, guys, we wrote this cool tool for uh, mimicking, um, for mocking server, uh, server side um, requests, server side responses in the browser. It was built for Angular 1, and it was called Leonardo, hence the, uh, the logo, uh, kind of the logo of the, of the tool. And they said, we really want to present it in your meetup. I said, OK, we looked at the tool. We really liked it. And we invited them over. And after a few months, they were being on stage showcasing their tool, like, like I'm doing now. Um, and at that point, two of my colleagues, Mayan and Alex, they were sitting in the audience. And they were listening to the talk. And they were getting both excited and upset. And the reason they got excited is because uh, they were looking at the tool, and they were, um, they were being like, Yes, this is exactly what we need for our, for our needs, for our clients, for our projects. Uh, we really want to use it. And they were getting upset because this tool was really tailor-made for Angular 1. So it worked really nice with protractor tests and all stuff like that. But it's really coupled to um, the way you build our application with Angular. And at that point, we were working with really a large project on React. And we just couldn't use it. So what we did is... Uh, we, after the meetup, we reached out to those guys and we said, we were really inspired by your, um, by your talk and by your tool. Um, we want to do something more framework agnostic. We went to the code. We tried to see if we could contribute back and make a tool work with React and other frameworks. And after spending some time in the code base, we understood that it's really not going to happen because it was really tightly coupled. And we had different UX decisions in mind, stuff like that. So we are asked permission to create a new tool, because you no, know, it's a small world. You don't want to make enemies, and it's all open source. Um, but you still have to uh, keep good relations with other people. And they said, yeah, we're really cool. Go, with, go for it, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, and the reason that I'm telling you this story is because my talk now and the tool we've built, um, it wouldn't happen without those guys reaching out to us to showcase their ideas or their concepts, their tools. Um, so what I'm the first takeaway from this talk is if you're working on something interesting, you have an interesting idea to share, interesting concept, reach out to meetup organizers, come on stage and speak about it, and you never know who will inspire, right? what come out of it. So after we decided to make our own tool, what do you think is the first challenge? Like when you come uh, decide to, um, um, when you come to a decision to create a new tool, what's the first problem, problem that you face? Name it. You heard the talk, actually. So don't, uh, don't ruin it. Yeah. Um, so first of all, you have to decide on a good name. And I struggle every day to find good names for variables uh, in my code. So like, think about, well, we are going to build a tool that will be open source, and people will use it. How do you find a name? So after some times, after a naming committee, we decided uh, to go with, uh, with a name, with a similar theme that um, the previous uh, tool was made of, and we called it Shredder.js. But quickly realized that it's, this name is not so good, because first of all, who would name his open source project Shredder.js? It just doesn't make sense. It's a bad name. And the second one, that we didn't want to imply any competition to the other tool, because we just wanted to make something for our need. So uh, then we, um, we gathered a naming committee again. And after some time, we came for a best name ever for an open source tool. Like, ta-da. It's called Beta Server Max. Like, it couldn't be better, right? Uh, and then after we found a good name for, for a tool, what would be the second challenge? And you don't spoil it. <laughs> what is the second challenge? <laughs> OK, now you've, you've refined the name. What's the next big thing to do? Naming and caching, no? Caching. <laughs> no, any ideas? Advertising. Hmm? Advertising? Advertising. No, even before that. We didn't start building it yet. Just... Talk by one hmm? <laughs> 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 OK. Uh, it's kind of similar to the previous problem. I'll give you a hint. Twitter? Twitter? No, not Twitter. So 
I'll tell you what it is. Uh, actually, it's finding good name on NPM, because this picture was taken about two months ago, and it had half a million packages there. Uh, and you just can't find any good name on NPM now. Uh, and a lot of people who are doing open source know this problem, yeah? <laughs> you see, so you know, this is a small world. And you recognize this guy? This is the guy who wrote Redux. It's like really popular. And for some reason, he was the guy who owned the BDSM package on NPM. <laughs> uh, you know. So we were in touch because we were writing a book at that, at that moment. And we, um, we spoke to him and I said, well, you have this uh, BDSM package on, uh, on NPM. It's not so used. You know, we have like a couple of downloads a month. Could you just give it to us? And he was like, yeah, sure. Like, take it. I like your project. Um, do whatever you want with it. Um, and then after we got the name and the NPM package, then came the, 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 the most difficult actual thing, is to decide what are we going to do. Um, so we had endless discussions about how we are going to uh, build our UI. How, we'd be, how would be um, the API, how should the API work? How should the, the whole thing be marketed? Um, should we build it with React, with Angular, or whatever? You name it. And at some point, after we spent days on discussing these things, I decided that that's it. I'm going to um, use my professional designer skills, um, as you can tell, are really strong. And I said, we are just going to build a POC. We're just going to build something, and we'll see how it goes. And after some time, we created this. Take a look at this piece of art for a moment. So this was the first prototype uh, version of the tool. As you can tell, it wasn't really usable. It was not so beautiful as well. But it did the job. It made us to actually sit and write some code and implement the first version and start gathering feedback from all the people in the company who used it. And after some time, uh, we really, um, um, you know, really hated this because it wasn't really usable. So then my Jan, my colleague, and then he decided to use his professional designer skills to make, to make a new version, a better one. And then he came uh, to this. It's also a piece of art, no, even better. Um, so this one uses material design and all kind of stuff. And this one, the, this was the actual first version that we used for over a year or so. Um, and also some of, so some of our clients used that. And we kind of, we were used to it and we liked it, it did the job. But we had some problems. We had problems promoting the package. So we, we used it, some of our clients used it, and we wanted the whole world to use it, right? But it was really hard to promote it. And first of all, as you can guess, it was really easy to find on Google. Right? You just write the name of the package, and you get um, you know, the website, you get the, um, the GitHub, or is it? So <laughs> actually, the other guys had slightly better SEO for the package than um, you know, a new tool that had 50,000 GitHub. And people, well, where they were looking for our tool, they were distracted by other more interesting things. <laughs> so yeah, and also the other problem was the UI. And let me tell you something, you never trust engineers to build UI for your tool, because that's what you end up with. You never do it. So no, we, we used the tool, really liked it. But um, other people, they were, they were uh, having really bad time understanding how to use it. Because when we use it, we, we know how to use it. But when we go to another person and try to explain it, uh, like, um, suddenly it becomes really cumbersome to explain how to use it. You have to click a lot of places just to make things work. That's really not, not very good UI. And the other thing is we discovered an open source secret. And some of the people that, that uh, work on open source here, they might know it, uh, is that no one actually cares about your project unless it becomes popular. So it's like no one would care to try it. Uh, and the fun fact is that when it becomes popular, you actually want less attention for it because you get blown away with questions and you no know, issues and stuff like that. You know, some people are noting, you know what I'm talking about. So it was kind of disappointing, uh, this whole stuff, but we never gave up. And uh, neither any of you should ever give up. And now I'll take a small, small detour to another story. So about, I don't know how many years ago, but a lot, a lot of years ago, even before I wanted to become a programmer, I discovered really talented designer 
um, um, on the internet. And his name was like kind of same as my name and kind of make this bond. Um, and I never met him in person, but I followed his um, blog posts. I followed his projects, what he did for a long time. And at some point, he came to Israel and he organized a small meetup where he would ask, answer people questions. Or people would just show him th their designs, and he could uh, tell his opinion about it, you know, just live Q&A. And I said, that, well, this is a good opportunity to meet a person that I never met before and you know, get to know each other. So I went to that meetup, and I asked if he would like to go for a drink. And after a few months, uh, we decided that he could help us build the new version of the tool. Uh, and we called it Mimic. So that's, I, I gave some hints in the beginning. Uh, so the name of the tool is now Mimic. I, I believe it's kind of better. And the reason that I tell you this story is because my talk now and the second version of the tool, it wouldn't happen uh, if not me reaching out to this guy and saying, well, do you want to have some coffee or drink and you know talk about life and about things we are doing? So really, don't be shy. Go meet other people. And you never know where your connections will lead you to. So. So now, this is how the tool looks like. Take a moment. So what we try to do, we try to uh, create, uh, with the new version, um, a look and feel of a tool that uh, we would like to see implemented in a browser. So like, this is how we'd like to see the tool built in Chrome developer tools or in you know, Edge developer tools. But I can show you screenshots forever. Actually, let me show you how it works. So you have an idea. Uh, and by the way, to use this tool, you just npm, uh, you just uh, npm install Mimic. And then all you do is this. Just import it. And then what you have is, for example, imagine you have to build a new um, UI feature, right? And the UI feature would be login screen. So what you can see here, you can see it. Um, here you see a new. UI popping up. And this is actually the whole Mimic. And what it does, it has a request log, and it has an interface for managing your mocks. And actually, let's implement the feature. So we, we need to implement a sign-in, but if I put my credentials, and it's Ilya and my usual password that I use for a lot of things, it's one to six, and I click Login, you see that uh, we are unable to connect the server, and we got Post to login 404. And the reason is that the API is not ready yet. And server guys are saying that it will take about a month to implement it. So what do we do now? Do we create a JSON server and try to create some mocks? Or do we create a proxy server in Node or do other things? But I have a better idea. If I go to, to log, I can see the, uh, the request here. And I double click on it, I can go and edit it. So what I can do is I could say, instead of 404, I could return 201 right, for this request. And let's say this is the request body. And let's say the response body, instead of this thing, I would call it, um, let's, say, let's say we'll first start with an error. So message, oh, knows. And now what I can do is I can click Login again. Oh, it's not a message. Maybe the error. Oh, we have a problem. Oh, no. Oh, no. Let's see. Let's start from scratch. This happens. One to six. Forget about it. Uh, it's not uh, It's not actual password. I use one to eight. So let's see. Can I post Login? Message, oh, knows. apply. Oh, now we have it working. So what I did, I actually mocked the request inside the browser, inside the browser and I changed the respond, but response body to be message, oh, knows. Ah, I know what I did. I changed it to 401 and it didn't catch it in the code. So now I can change my error messages, right? It was pretty easy. And also, did you see that I could just click on my um, on my request and just edit it in line? Pretty cool. And now, 
what if I'd like to actually return um, a successful thing? So for example, instead of error message, I would return access token. Let's say one, two, three. And now when I click login, I instantaneously I get redirected to a success page. It's pretty nice. And remember, there's no configuration, just one import, and you can start using it. But now, let's go further. For example, if instead of Ilya, I write uh, Matt and use his password, it's 621, and click login, I can see that I am still uh, receiving the message that's unable to connect to server. And that's because my uh, mock is configured to use username Ilya and password 1 to 6. But what I can do, I can use wildcard instead of it. Oh. And now, when I use Matt's password 6 to 1, I click login, and I get success. Oh, if you're not excited, this is the most amazing thing I've ever, I've ever seen. <laughs> um, what else? What happens if I want to see how a uh, slow server would, response, would respond? Forgive me my English. So I can, instead of using two milliseconds, I could actually um, put it to two seconds here in the editor. And now let's write complete gibberish. And now you can see that we have a spinner. Cool. Um, let's get back to our presentation, because I don't really have enough time to show all the features, but there are a lot of features. We did a complete rewrite from the first version to the second version. And we have Reach API. It, you, can, you can use it for end-to-end uh, -end tests. You can, do, like, you, you can work with React Native, with native script. I can use Fetch, uh, XHR, whatever you want. It's really cool. But now let's actually get to technical details, um, because that's why, why we are here. So first of all, I want to speak about some of the problems that we had building this tool. And there were a lot, but I'm going to focus only on some of them. Who knows this guy? CSS. It's like the worst nightmare of front-end developers. It haunts you at night. And why? Because of this small thing, CSS bleeding. So if you don't know what CSS bleeding is, is actually when you write um, a style uh, or a CSS style sheet for one component, and it interferes with some other component completely unrelated to it. Uh, this is called CSS bleeding. And there are some, um, some things that we could do to prevent it. So first of all, you could use iframe. Um, iframe is a nice, nice way to, um, to kind of sandbox all of your style sheets, because you create um, an, a document inside a document. And then you put all your stuff there, and you create style sheets. But we had some problems with that. And first, first and foremost, the APIs uh, in the browser is really hard to implement with iframes, because iframes only support post messages. It, it means that our API for Mimic should be serializable, and we can't use cool stuff like uh, class instances and stuff like that. So we quickly um, you know, abandoned this feature. But fun fact that the first version actually used iframes. And we'll speak about it uh, in a bit. Also, CSS all property, something new that, um, that came out recently. Sorry. Um, and it allows you to reset all these styles for, um, for a specific element on the page. Uh, but it doesn't work with I and Edge, and some people still use it, and I'm sorry for them, but we still love them, and we have to support them. Um, and also, CSS resets, um, you could create uh, a style sheet that would uh, override all the default styles for, um, for components. But the problem is that, um, you know, for example, if you use important in your style sheets, it would break. And I'm, I'm a bit sorry that it's not like a node talk, uh, but bear with me. So what we did is we implemented custom elements uh, called Mimic Div and Mimic Span, and that's how we solved most of the problems with, um, um, with CSS bleeding. And we had, uh, we, had, we had some problems with that. We solved everything. If anyone here is interested in, in how we did it, uh, come to me afterwards. I'll show, I'll show you the code. Um, the whole code that we are not proud of, it's out there. It's open source. So, um, Also, the code editor was one of the, uh, one of the problems, and if let me ask you a question. Did any of you implement a code editor inside their application at least once? Oh, so you probably know that these libraries are really heavy in terms of putting callbacks and event listeners and styling on pages. And uh, because our, we wanted to have rich editor and mimic, 
they couldn't uh, let it interfere with the hosting application because people will just abandon it, right? And uh, what about if you also have a code editor inside your, your application, how would they work together with all the styling and uh, you know all the um, event listeners? So what we had to do, we had to put code editor inside iframe so to, uh, to prevent all of these uh, callbacks and um, event listeners uh, to interfering with the host application. And what, what actually happened is that in the first version, we had an iframe, and within that iframe, we had another iframe with code editor. And we had this whole mess of communication between components. Um, but it worked. Sometimes we have to write ugly code to make things work, right? Uh, another problem was Fetch API, and I'm, I'm going to skip this because it's not so interesting. Um, oh, Fetch API. Uh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I speak about Fetch API, uh, it's, a, it's a new way to, uh, to do network requests. Um, and it's kind of it's a new thing. It should replace XHR. And I honestly, I really hated this API. Don't tell anyone. Um, I think that it's, it's a lot of more cumbersome to use that XHR, but we use it in our projects. A lot of clients use it. We have to support it. Uh, and the problem with Fetch API is that a lot of, a lot of um, platforms do not implement it as by spec. So for example, uh, Chrome has bugs with cloning Fetch APIs, um, Fetch requests. And NativeScript didn't even support the cloning feature and all stuff like that. So we ended up uh, contributing to other projects for them to, to fully support Fetch APIs so Mimic could work with them. So we kind of uh, contributed to NativeScript and contributed to um, Xhook, the library that we use. Um, you know, come to me, I'll, I'll, I'll cry a lot about Fetch. So now about the UI challenges. And UI challenges, this is something uh, subjective, because if I'm going to show what uh, the slides I'm, I have, a lot, of, a lot of you would say, well, you guys are crazy. And things that you notice, um, no one would care about it. But I think that if you, if you want to create really great um, user-facing tool, and DX is very important, like developer experience, you have to um, put details on, um, put um, attention to a lot of small details, because you know, that's what makes a uh, good product great. So for example, uh, we had problems with font rendering. So once I got um, a comment from the designer that in Safari, these, um, this font wasn't subpixel rendered properly. So we can have to, um, we had to go in all places and enable subpixel rendering. Um, 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 sometimes, well, Mimic has a lot of custom controls. Uh, and if you're not careful enough, if you click on, on drop downs or buttons and you move your mouse t a tiny bit to, uh, to the left or to the right, you, keep, you start selecting text inside a button. So you have to apply like user select none on all of it. Um, and you know, uh, one pixel jumps is something that terrifies my eyes. Is when you have tabs and one of the tabs has, um, like the active tab has slightly wider text because it's bolder. And then when you switch between tabs, they are kind of jump one or two pixels uh, because you no know, text gets bolder and um, and the border gets bigger. So we had to kind of do crazy stuff to just make it work really nice. Um, also resizing was a problem. Off canvas, like old good friend of old developers, um, you know the uh, context menu stuff like that. So we had a lot of challenges, but we uh, we will face a lot more challenges in the future. And this, is, this might be really interesting and important to people that are planning to work on open source um, and didn't face this, those challenges yet. Um, but I believe we would have them, and a lot of people would have them too. So first of all is everything related to the documentation. Because we are developers are really good about getting things done and getting things work. But when it comes to explaining it to other people, we're kind of, wow, uh, we don't know what to say. Um, just take a look at tests and figure out yourself. And it's really hard to write good tutorials and good documentation. Um, and a tip to some of you that want to contribute to open source and you don't know how and you are afraid to break others' code, please go, go to any project that you like and help them with the documentation. And they will really appreciate it because no developer has time for doc documentation, but it's really important uh, to make the tool popular and uh, easy to use for others. Um, so if you would like to contribute, you don't know how, our documentation would be a good start. Also, community indifference. Um, and this is an interesting uh, thing that I don't know how to solve yet. Um, 
And as I told you, the, the secret of open source is that no one actually cares about your project um, unless it becomes popular. And it's really true, because if you were using one product for a lot of time, so for example, you use JSON server for, for two years now, how can I convince you to try this new tool that you're not used to, that you don't know how it works, that you don't trust? Um, and even I, if, I, if I convince you and you find bugs, how could I convince you to actually go to the GitHub page and file an issue instead of just you know, scratching it and going back to your old, old preference? So this is really hard. And if you have any ideas on how to change people and how to fix the world, please come speak to me afterwards, because I didn't find a way yet. Um, you know, supporting binary formats, because these whole things work in a browser, and um, we save the whole mimic stuff in, um, in local storage, and now what would happen if you want to support images or files? How do you store them? Um, you know, supporting other platforms and increasing platform uh, support for React Native and NativeScript and all the other you know, TVs, you name it. Uh, so we have su some support for them, but and there's a lot of work to, uh, to do. And also, one of the most important things is staying sane with all of it. Uh, because you know, to build the second version of the tool, it took, it took us two months to do the same amount of commits we did for a year. So we work on, on weekends and, on, and at nights and uh, all our free time. It's really, really easy to get burned out. So it's really important to, um, you know, to stay sane and to keep your work-life balanced right there and uh, don't get you know, uh, disappointed when people file issues and they say, well, this just doesn't work. Um, I don't want to use this tool and even more mean stuff. Um, and by that, I'd want to invite you to um, the website for Mimic, mimic.js.org, and try it out. And if you have fellow um, front end developers, show it to them. And please star us, because that's the only way I know how to make the project popular. I want to collect all the stars. And that's it, I guess. <laughs> oh, don't forget cafes and restaurants. Yeah. Anybody have questions? Have time for questions? Good question. So, with your. Oh. Sorry, thanks. So, I've been a developer for a while uh, and um from front end to back end coming from different platforms and now on node one of the things that I've, I've in my experience seen that front end developers had i always considered myself a hybrid because i started in the back end but i was the graphic designer way back in the day so i was always dealing with class css and style and um did you in one of your challenges in fixing your uh style issues did you try to namespace your styles because and you've had issues with that? Uh, the only issue we had with that is just really, um, it's, it's a lot of overhead. So there are a lot of solutions like using BAM, like um, something that people at Yandex invented. It's uh, using namespace for your blocks, elements, and, uh, and small, smaller things. Um, and I just plain don't like it because you really have to add a lot of overhead to your code and have to remember how things work. It's just not simple enough. OK. So it sounds like you're a server-side developer doing front-end work, and that's some of the challenges. Would, would, would you agree? If what? <clears throat> it sounds like you could be a server-side developer mm -hmm. doing front-end work, mm -hmm. and some of the challenges are having the trope, the treasure trope of your experience from the back end, mm -hmm. and then stepping into the front-end side, and it's been not using the front-end guys, mm -hmm. tried and true uh, testing styles to mm -hmm. kind of get the stuff working. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot, a lot of people who come from, um, you know, from backend, uh, usually they have, I don't know, sometimes some people are more strong with front end, some people are less strong. But you know, CSS is uh, really, really, um, I'd say, one of the worst things in front end development because um, I, I think I've heard a quote that the amount of people in in the whole company that could actually understand how CSS in the project works is one. So more, more, more than one person would be a mess. And it's really hard to maintain. So um, we tried to solve it the best way we could for us and for other people to contribute. I hopefully it would you know, answer your question. But well, I'll definitely contact you. CSS isn't as scary as you think it is. Aren't you familiar with We use style components for React, and it kind of solve the, uh, make abstraction from all the CSS. So it's kind of not messing with all the style sheets now. So write just write components. But CSS is not scary, just, you know. Like anything. Back-end work is scary to people, the front-end guys. So. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right. I trust the 
So you mentioned that you're using local storage to to store the mocks. Is there any way to share those mocks between between members of the team? Because it seems like that would be a big requirement yes. of the tool. For, first of all, we have this export and import um, functionality when you can just export specific mock or a group or everything and just uh, share it with the other person. And we also, if you use Webpack, uh, we have a feature to automatically take mocks from specific folder on your computer and then automatically like synchronizing them with all of the team. So you can just put it on GitHub and then uh, write some two lines of code and then Mimic automatically, automatically picks it up. Great, great. I have a question. Then we have time. Other question? Yeah, question. Okay, just speak louder, and I I'll repeat the question. Know how to use this thing, right? <laughs> just like speak into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we all are engineers here. We can right, we can understand. Um, just uh, the two custom elements that yeah. you mentioned. Uh, they look like custom web components. Could you uh, speak a little bit about your experience with that? Which polyfill you use? And we just use React, and it provides this uh, this out of the box. It's really easy. Just instead of writing div, you write mimic div, and that's work. Uh, that works, but you can definitely use things like um, web components or custom elements, like create elements, stuff like that. React is a good thing to do. Do it. Test, test. Okay. <laughs> I, I have to turn it on. Yeah. Uh, hey. Um, so when you look at this tool and you want to uh, like share the mocks, uh, when it's a large team, you'd more than likely then be opting to set up a service, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so is there plans to, to do that with this tool? Uh, there are plans, but we have a, a large roadmap, and we only that that much people. So if you'd like to help with building these things, reach out to me and yeah. It will, it will be at some point, but automatic synchronization between teams and stuff like that. I can't, just, I can't promise when. All right, let's give it up for Thank you.